appreciate the uh, presence of everyone for this uh, <clears throat> study of the Book of Romans. We left off last time uh, at the end of chapter four, and so we'd be starting with chapter four, uh, five this week. Before we uh, engage in our study, though, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the ability to gather together to this uh, medium of the internet. We're thankful for the subject of our study, which is by Holy Writ, and particularly this uh, epistle to the Romans. The truths that are stated there, we pray, Father, that we may learn them, that we may incorporate them into our lives and be better prepared to be useful in the service of our Lord Master Jesus Christ. We pray that you'll continue to bless us as we, as we study thy word. And we pray, Father, that all those who are now outside of Christ would uh, yield to the call of the gospel, that they also may know the blessings that are for those that are in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we start with uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 5. <clears throat> And it begins with therefore, which means in light of what's already been said. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So justification by faith has uh, now been established. And having been justified by faith, uh, Paul makes the following conclusion. Therefore, we have peace with God through the agency or by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the having been justified uh, preceded and was necessary to the we have peace. A justified person has been pronounced to be free from guilt or blame. The justification by faith is predicated on uh, conditions of faith set by the forgiver and not by the forgiven. The fulfillment of the conditions of faith precedent to justification are accomplished by the forgiven and not the forgiver. <clears throat> if the in the eleventh chapter of Hebrews we see that the examples of faith were proved to be faithful by obedience to the things prescribed. Faith that describes there has always been a working faith. God set the conditions, the faithful fulfilled those conditions at, at which time they were justified. They took God at his word and did what he was commanded. Did what he commanded. <clears throat> In verse 2, through whom, that is Jesus, through whom, and also, we have access by faith into his grace. Uh, that comes from the Greek word charis, or charis. And it's mostly translated in grace. <clears throat> we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we could add, uh, and stand and rejoice, we could add, and through whom we rejoice. And you can look at uh, previously in, in Romans, the uh, second chapter, verse 17 and 23. And we'll get into uh, fifth chapter, verse 3, 4, and, and 11. This is in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. A state of sin is a state of enmity towards God, that it is, it emanates. From us. Grace is a state of favor from God to us, that is, a state of being justified and accepted of God. The means of this uh, of access into the grace is by faith, which is more than uh, intellectual acknowledgement of a fact. Beyond that, is it is the fulfillment of the acts demanded by that intellectual acknowledgement. It is through Christ 
and the provisions he has made for one to put on or enter into Christ. He tells the Romans that now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Uh, that's in Ephesians second chapter verse 13. The phrase in Christ is uh, repeated over 80 times in the New Testament and almost all by Paul. In the uh, word in, as in in hope, designates, designates location. And Paul knew what it was to be in Christ, considering his previous persecution uh, of the church and how to get there. Specifically, it would be baptism, which is a culmination of, of the steps in the plan of salvation. That is saving faith. When that is accomplished, then we may become partakers of the divine nature, Second Peter, Peter chapter one, verse four. Therein the Christian may rejoice in hope, and that is a reasonable expectation. Rejoice uh, in the hope of the glory of God, which signifies the honor and extreme happiness provided to the redeemed. In verse three, it says, and not only that, but we glory, <clears throat> and the uh, ASV has rejoice, and it's the same word as rejoice in the 11th verse uh, later on in the chapter, which is exaltation, triumph, that sort of idea. We also glory in tribulations. Uh, that's the afflictions that uh, befall us because of of life and just and being a Christian. It says not only that, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And uh, King James uses patience, and the ASB uses steadfastness. <clears throat> and <clears throat> James in uh, chapter uh, one, verses two and three of that book said. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Christ endured the cross with a joy that was set before him, in Hebrews 12, chapter verse 2. It says they're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And of course, the cross is uh, what uh, J.D. spoke on. And uh, so just keep in mind what he said. The writer of Hebrews wrote, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. That's in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, verse 11. Perseverance is that quality of character which does not allow one to surrender to circumstances or succumb under trial. Affiliations, uh, when recognized for what they are, have the effect of forming this trait, the frequency of which these occur makes apparent the necessity for perseverance and patience. Paul bragged on the Thessalonians for their patience. Uh, second uh, Thessalonians, first chapter four, verse four says that, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. In verse four of chapter five, and he goes on uh, speaking of this uh, uh, tribulations, says, and perseverance, uh, character, 
uh, as experienced in King James Version and approvedness in the ASV. So it says in perseverance, character, uh, and character, hope. So perseverance produces character and character produces hope. So character in a, in a Christian denotes uh, that he has been put to the test by affliction, has successfully endured the ordeal, and now stands purified and approved of God. And you uh, might refer to James first chapter verse three that we read just a moment ago. Then we may rightly lay hold of hope that we may be partakers of the uh, divine nature. And also again, to look at Second uh, Peter, uh, first chapter, verse four that we referred to previously. <clears throat> In verse five, it says, now hope does not disappoint. Uh, well, it doesn't disappoint those who have this hope. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that's for those who live by the Spirit. Uh, who was given to us. <clears throat> this hope of the divine nature will not in the end disappoint us. And then Paul will speak more about this later. We will realize that, uh, that for which we have hoped. We we'll realize that, and therefore, we we'll never have to feel ashamed that we have hoped, and we're not going to be disappointed. God's love is poured out <clears throat> as a fountain by the agency of the Holy Spirit. It was the apostles that first received the Holy Spirit, and that in full measure. In First Corinthians, the second chapter, verse twelve, we read. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. To others, other than the apostles, uh, they were given a, a limited measure of the Holy Spirit. And all have received the Holy Spirit through the word. That's the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. In imparting to us the knowledge of God, the Holy Spirit imparts the same mind, the same feelings, the same disposition that God possesses, possesses. In doing so, we love as God loves. We love those that God loves. And we love for the same reason that God loves. In Ephesians the third, uh, first chapter, verses 13 through 14, it reads, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And in Second Corinthians, uh, First chapter, verses 21 and 22. Now he who establishes us with you is in Christ and has anointed us as God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And in 2 Corinthians, the fifth uh, chapter, verse five. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. In verse uh, six of chapter five, <clears throat> it says, for when we, that's Jew and Gentile alike, are still without strength or weak as the ASV uh, calls it, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's for the Jew and Gentile sinners. And we'll say more about that in um, chapter five, verse eight, below the verse, uh, no, verse eight below. But anyway, we were unable to save ourselves either by atonement for past sins or by future obedience. 
the time set by the, the father, that is the due time, is the right time for past, present, and future generations for Christ to come as a man and do for us what we could not do for ourselves, that is, save us from our sins. So what was uh, determined in the mind of God beforehand was done in, quote unquote, due time, the right time. In verse 7 of chapter 5, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Now this is uh, drawn from human nature. <clears throat> there seemed to be an order, an order here. Uh, for a good man, that's one living at his high standard of what is deemed to be good, there might be found one that is willing to die uh, for another, but just barely. For the righteous man, one doesn't, uh, that's one who does right, but never goes the extra mile that uh, love would demand. Few and far between would there be found one to die uh, for such one uh, righteous man. <clears throat> Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the uh, supreme demonstration of God's love for fallen man, Christ died not only for the good man, not only for the righteous man, but also for the ungodly man. No sensible person would die for the scandal, but Christ did. God's love for us has always existed. And Christ's sacrifice uh, was the demonstration of that love. <clears throat> In verse 9, <clears throat> much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. If Christ died to redeem us while we were still sinners, uh, much more will he save us from punishment for sin now that we have been forgiven. The blood of Christ is the great antecedent reason that enables God to be just while justifying the unjust. If the, uh, justified by his blood, quote unquote, means forgiveness, and it is the blood of Christ that procures forgiveness. Now, what we call the five steps in the plan of salvation do not procure justification. They are precedent conditions to contacting the blood of Christ, which washes away our sins, at which time we are justified. When we are justified, we are saved from divine punishment. In verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We were enemies in that uh, we did not do his will. And at the time, we were not inclined to do so. A man must be reconciled to God. God does not need to be reconciled to man. Uh, reconciliation implies a change. That God does not change. There is no mutual change in reconciliation. Being a God of justice, he was bound to punish the guilty. Being a God of love, he gave his son to die for us. The death of Christ is the most outstanding proof of God's love for us. Therefore, we love him because he first loved us. 1 John 4th chapter, verse 19. It was through his resurrection that he was able to pass through the veil and offer his blood on the heavenly holy of holies. It is by living after his death 
that he consummates all the provisions of salvation. There is no other way apparent in which Christ's life can have the effect to save us. It is in him that we have all spiritual blessings. Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 3. <clears throat> verse 11 of chapter 5, and that's not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And that reconciliation is uh, translated atonement in the King James uh, Version. And in the New Testament, uh, this word is only used by Paul, nobody else. To rejoice in God is to rejoice in Him as our Heavenly Father, as having forgiven our sins and having filled us with the hope of eternal life. The reconciliation comes by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ comes by His sacrificial death as a sin offering, which takes away our sin. For that to happen, we must believe that Christ died as a sin offering for us individually, not for someone else, as the Paschal Lamb that takes away sin and satisfying the concomitant conditions of belief and obedience. When obeyed, Paul speaks of reconciliation as a present reality of a future hope. And of course, uh, Paul will speak about hope later. <clears throat> In verse 12, <clears throat> therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin, and that's the, uh, it's in the Greek aorist tense. It is the action of each man. It is in the sense that all accountable men have sinned. This uh, verse to the end of the chapter is, uh, of course, one of the more uh, difficult, maybe, I'd say the most difficult, but wait till we get in some later passages, maybe more difficult than this. It's one of the most difficult passages of the epistle anyway. If it is considered illative, and uh, illative just means one thought leads to another, there by leading one along to an inference or conclusion, and that's what this does. Now, then we must locate the conclusion and what is the premise uh, on which the conclusion is based. The premise first stated is that sin entered the world through one man. Uh, but, uh, but before that, it is stated in verse 10 that we were reconciled to the death of Christ. What must be explained is why we were, uh, why were we enemies and why did God, uh, Jesus, have to die? So one premise leads to another until the conclusion is reached in the uh, verse 18, or maybe I should say the conclusion begins in verse 18. The one uh, man, that one man was Adam. After Adam's sin, we hear no other sins uh, by him. I, I'm sure that he had some, but we don't hear any other sin by him. Yet uh, one sin was enough. Death did not enter the world through the second the third sin, but through the first. Death extended to all men because of that one sin. Now, death did not result from sin in the sense of a cause effect. In Genesis, Genesis the second chapter, verses 15 to 17, God said that of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And there's nothing said about the fruit itself being toxic. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, death was not immediate. So it was not the fruit itself that caused their ultimate death. Eating of the fruit transgressed God's commandment and therefore was sin. That's what sin is. The relationship between the act 
and death was one of crime and punishment. God, being a God of justice, had to impose a penalty for sin. In this case, it was death. Physical, which spread to all mankind. And spiritual, because all men have sinned. It is a case that we suffer physical death because of Adam's sin. Uh, and, and it should also be noted that Adam and Eve were also driven out of the Garden of Eden. Now, you know, we're now reading in Genesis, the third chapter, verses 17 and 18, Cursed is the ground for your sake and toil, you shall, you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, and shall bring uh, forth for you. And that kind of reminds me of my own garden, but uh, I think that's a different situation altogether. <laughs> this is simply the uh, result of sin, uh, not because we are guilty of that sin, Sin can affect others who are not guilty of that sin at all. We recognize that. However, we suffer spiritual death because of our own sin and not because of Adam's. As Paul said, uh, you know, recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter verses 21 through 22, for since by man, uh, it's a lowercase singular, since by man came death, by man, that's uppercase singular, same Greek word in both cases. Uh, you know, the translators added the uppercase uh, because the obvious, obvious uh, reference to the second man is to Christ. Uh, it says, by man, uppercase, uh, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all should be made alive. Death is a result of guilt, but not necessarily of the one dying. And of course, this should impress upon us the enormity of sin. In verse 13, it reads, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Uh, generally, when talking of law, the uh, writer has reference to the law of Moses. But Adam, Adam and Eve sinned there for of necessity, because the statement is true, there had to be a law regulating conduct with respect to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was not the law of Moses, but something else in an unwritten form. If we take law to mean any commandment or instruction of God, the transgression of which invokes a penalty, then there was law when God forbade Adam and Eve from eating the fruit from the forbidden tree on penalty of death. <clears throat> in verse 14, it says, therefore, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Prior to the giving of the written law of Moses, uh, physical death, that's the penalty of Adam's sin, was a fact from Adam to Moses, even though for those who had not sinned, as did Adam. And never again will they, there be a sin such as Adam's, which introduced sin into a sinless world. It does not say that they had not sinned at all. In fact, they were wicked beyond measure, and God destroyed them in the global flood, save eight souls. They all died without a written law. The question may arise as to why God had not given them a written law. Well, it was uh, because they were not ready for it. As is the case uh, with God, the law of Moses was given at just the right time for a people to receive it, the due time. The right time, of course, uh, does not mean that they obeyed it. It was just the due time for the law of Moses to be given. <clears throat> 
to Adam was a type of Christ. <clears throat> the uh, one act of Adam was disobedience to the command of God, which introduced sin into the world and condemned man to death. The one act of Jesus, that's obedience to death on the cross, uh, which was man's salvation from sin. One produced death, the other life. As quoted before, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 22, uh, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. This Adam is a type of Christ. And the next section is kind of long, so I think uh, since we're almost at the bottom of the hour, I'll, I'll stop. We are at the bottom. I'll stop right here and we'll begin 15th verse uh, next week.